Hello, my name is Brian Girl. I am an assistant professor uh, at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, and I practice primarily in neuroanesthesia. Today I will be covering the central and peripheral nervous systems for our advanced topics in anesthesiology portion of our board review. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, our objectives are physiology, then pharmacology, followed by clinical science. Uh, if you've looked at the board review outline, uh, there are a dramatic number of uh, topics. I will try to cover them in reasonable detail as well as provide uh, the tips and tidbits that differentiate one uh, diagnosis from another and are more likely to be uh, tested on the boards. Beginning with physiology, uh, the first thing we look at with physiology is cerebral metabolism. Uh, that's primarily abbreviated as CMRO2 uh, because the brain is effectively oxygen dependent using 3.5 cc's of oxygen per 100 grams per minute. 60% of that uh, metabolic rate is to electrical activity and 40% is to cellular function. So if you are to give a uh, sedation or of propofol or a, a high dose of any uh, anesthetic that reduces electrical activity as measured by an isoelectric EEG, that's only going to knock out 60% of your metabolic rate. Uh, the 40% that is baseline cellular function and maintenance of enzymes and, uh, and membrane uh, homeostasis is going to remain there unless you decrease the temperature. So uh, to go after that 40% of metabolic rate, you will need to decrease the temperature with hypothermia. The brain has a high oxygen extraction ratio uh, such that if there is a PaO2 less than 60, you will have a dramatic increase in cerebral blood flow because with uh, extracting it from a PaO2 of just 60, uh, the brain will be quite ischemic. The substrate for the brain is primarily glucose, although like lactate and ketones do play minor roles, in it, particularly in pathologic states, uh, particularly uh, ketones in starvation and lactate uh, during any issue with ischemic brain injury. The Monroe Kelly Doctrine states that the skull and its contents exist in a closed space. Any increase in the volume of one component must be matched by a decrease in another component or the pressure will increase. This is why we're so concerned about intracranial pressure. Intra-abdominal pressure, intrathoracic pressure, uh, those are less critical. Uh, the issue with the intracranial pressure is that whenever you have a dramatic increase in, in the volume of one of those components and the pressure increases, then you start to squeeze brain out of the skull, and those are herniation syndromes that we'll talk about soon. With regard to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, uh, Many people teach that the brain is 80%, CSF is 12%, and blood is 8%. Uh, I made this graph as 70% brain, 10% CSF, 10% blood, and 10% interstitial fluid in order to emphasize that if we're trying to reduce intracranial pressure, it would be uh, one of the first things that we'll do is use hyperosmolar therapy that will reduce the volume of the interstitial fluid. So if you think of the four volumes that you have to manipulate uh, to reduce intracranial pressure, then you have four targets to work on and you'll understand the different modes uh, in order to reduce intracranial pressure. Some people talk about intracranial compliance. Uh, we're actually looking at intracranial elastance. It's important to remember the compliance is change in volume divided by a change in pressure. In the case of the brain, uh, we are looking for elastance, which is a change in pressure given a change in volume. So typically our volume change will be a hemorrhage, either subdural or subarachnoid, or just edema due to traumatic brain injury. We see a period of compensation by which significant changes in volume result in only small changes in intracranial pressure. That is due to the compensation mechanism of CSF 
as well as venous blood shifting out of the brain, out of the skull rather, uh, in order to compensate so that the intracranial pressure doesn't change dramatically. However, uh, you will eventually experience a breakthrough in intracranial pressure at a critical volume by which slight changes in volume result in dramatic changes in intracranial pressure. And these are the people that we really worry about. Signs of, and symptoms of intracranial pressure include headache, uh, lethargy and weakness, vision changes due to uh, shifts in compression of the optic nerves, uh, nausea and vomiting, and late changes of high intracranial pressure will include altered consciousness. This is a diagram showing the various mechanisms of herniation. The first is subfalcine or cingulate herniation. It is the most common type. Uh, it is always accompanied by altered consciousness and it is evidenced by the uh, medial portion of the uh, of a cerebral hemisphere herniating under the falcs and causing anterior cerebral artery compression with contralateral leg paresis. Uh, whenever this occurs, uh, it is typically fairly well responsive to uh, hyperventilation or hyperosmolar therapy in order to reduce intracranial pressure. Central herniation uh, is normally produced by hydrocephalus or a traumatic brain injury always evidenced by altered consciousness, sometimes uh, evidenced by a downward gaze deviation as in the patient in the upper picture. Uh, the pathology here is a diencephalon and uh, cerebral hemispheres herniating through the tentorium cerebelli. Uh, this results in uh, small fixed dilated pupils and a fixed downward gaze. Uh, that all won't last for long because the patient typically develops uh, direct hemorrhages secondary to shearing of basilar artery branches and is usually fatal. Uncle herniation is another classic herniation syndrome. Uh, patients would have altered consciousness and typically ipsilateral medriasis, that being a dilated pupil, due to parasympathetic loss. Uh, you lose parasympathetic, parasympathetic innervation because those nerves course on the surface of cranial nerve 3 and are affected first. Uh, further compression leads to loss of innervation from cranial nerve 3, allowing cranial nerves 4 and 6 to take over and the eye to deviate down and out. Accompanied by this, you can have cerebral uh, peduncle uh, compressions. The cerebral peduncles descend, uh, contain the descending corticospinal fibers. Ipsilateral pressure by a mass on the ipsilateral cerebral peduncle uh, will cause a contralateral paresis. However, the mass can also shift the, both peduncles to the opposite side, causing a contralateral compression at the tentorium and an ipsilateral paresis. So that is considered a false localizing sign and is something that a, a, a very thorough neuro examination uh, would be able to pick up. Looking at tonsil, her, tonsillar herniation, you have altered consciousness and herniation of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum. Uh, this leads to brainstem compression and cardiorespiratory collapse. This is a particular concern whenever we're doing surgery in the posterior fossa that increased pressure in that area uh, could lead to cardiorespiratory compromise and uh, bleeds in this area are typically not well, uh, not well tolerated by patients. This diagram details the 22 standard points on an EEG. Uh, it is important to realize that the EEG is used to record differences between those different, between each of those points. 
Now this diagram looks fairly complicated and we'll look at some more complicated EEG brain waves. So beginning in a patient that is awake with mental activity like hopefully my audience is now, you'll have beta waves at 14 to 30 hertz. Uh, if I'm starting to lose you, uh, you will shift into an alpha wave state at 8 to 13 hertz. And if you're completely asleep already, uh, theta waves at 4 to 7 hertz. Hopefully you haven't reached a deep sleep this early in the recording uh, with delta waves at less than 3.5 hertz. I cannot imagine that they would ask you to uh, interpret an EEG, uh, but here is one. And we can see that this does look uh, fairly complicated. Using my pointer here, we can see that something obviously changes and we have rhythmic activity in this period uh, that is likely a seizure. But how are we going to actually assess an EEG uh, intraoperatively. We can have a neurophysiologist watch it for us, however, that's not something that the boards really offers as an, an explanation. So we think about processed EEGs. Uh, basically taking the a, a Fourier transform, you can determine the power of the EEG. Uh, Further analyzing that, you can use this, you look at the spectral edge of the power. Uh, so the SEF 95 would say, would be, the, the answer to SEF 95 would be a frequency uh, below which 95% of the total signal is generated. And you would call that the spectral edge frequency. Higher frequency means that the patient is more awake. So if you're awake, you would expect an SEF 95 of greater than 20 hertz. Under general anesthesia, your SEF 95 should be less than 12 hertz. There are various systems that have been developed in order to process an EEG into a simple number that would be recordable and you could titrate your anesthetic to that value in order to eliminate recall. This is a quite complex diagram of the Sedline uh, algorithm from Massimo where you can see that there are a number of different uh, filters uh, and analyses that are performed in order to remove artifact, uh, edit data, and perform frequency transforms, and then uh, compute and a, a number on the scale of, of 1 to 100, or 0 to 100, I should say, that would give how, determine how awake the patient was, that you could then alter your anesthetic in order to suit. They don't work that well they might talk to you on the boards about awareness. This is the BAG recall study. It was published in the New England Journal in 2011. They randomized 2,800 patients per group at three different academic centers. They were considered to be high risk for recall, either uh, ASA class four patients, patients with lim limited functional capacity, or open heart surgery. Uh, there were some other predictors of, of being high risk uh, but that was what most of their patients uh, fell into. Uh, we can see based on the awareness classifications that in the BIS group, the upper two, uh, two, col two rows here, that they had actually more evidence of more complaints of intraoperative recall than did the ETAC group. Uh, the groups were randomized and then either their anesthetic was titrated in the BIS group to a value of uh, 40 to 60 or the ETAC group where they were titrated to a MAC of greater than 0.7 of volatile anesthetic uh, 
uh, in that MAC value concentrated uh, titrated per age with a 10% decrease in MAC for each decade over the age of 40. Again, uh, titrating to BIS was shown to be less effective in terms of preventing awareness than was the end title. There are a number of, uh, of editorials that, and letters to the editor that were written uh, regarding this, and those are interesting to read uh, as well. Another way that we look at the EEG is the presence of silent periods in the EEG, uh, and those are known as burst suppression. They're often requested to reduce cerebral metabolic rate during carotid cr cross clamping or during a uh, temporary pl clip placement during aneurysm surgery. Again, this will reduce that 60% of the cerebral metabolic rate that is due to electrical activity, but won't touch the underlying 40% due to uh, basic cellular maintenance. Uh, it can be achieved typically with approximately 1.5 mAC of volatile agent. Uh, the dose response curve of propofol is such that it's very difficult to predict how much propofol will be required uh, in order to achieve burst suppression if you're simply using propofol uh, or if you're bolusing propofol in addition to uh, the use of a volatile anesthetic. There are a number of items on the outline that are related to how does this condition impact EEG. One of those is ischemia on the EEG. And you will have slowing with a cerebral blood flow of approximately 18 cc's per 100 grams per minute. Uh, books reference values between 18 and 22. The EEG will be flat with a cerebral blood flow of approximately 10 cc's per 100 grams per minute and a sustained blood flow of only 100 of 10 per 100 grams per minute uh, will result in uh, loss of cells and in basically irreversible neuronal death. Hypercarbia on EEG, CO2 tends to be a neurodepressant. Uh, however, it has had minimal impact on EEG in studies. A greater impact uh, would be hypercarbia on intracranial pressure. Uh, hypoxemia on EEG uh, actually shows an initial increase in activity. So with the onset of abrupt, on, abrupt onset of ischemia, there will be initial increase in activity followed by uh, a period of hypoxic brain that has less electrical activity. We will talk about other monitors of neurophysiology, including SSEP and MEP signals, and those too will be decreased by hypoxemia in the brain. Hypothermia on EEG. Uh, often patients in the OR will have uh, a temperature of around 34 or 35 degrees uh, Celsius as a core temperature and that will have minimal effect on the EEG. If you get down to a, a temperature uh, much below 25 degrees C, you will end up with EEG silence. So you'll have si silence at room temperature, and this will also reduce SSEP as well as MEP signals. Brain death is something that can be evaluated on EEG as well. It's not required for brain death, for a brain death diagnosis in, result, in adults. However, it is essential in young children. Uh, it's important to realize that whenever you're testing the EEG, you're testing the cortex only and not the brain stem. So you can have a cortex that has not been injured, but a brain stem that is uh, entirely uh, decimated. Confounders to diagnosing brain death on EEG includes medications, uh, including opiates, uh, any sedative, any anesthetic. Uh, 
uh, toxic metabolic causes that can cause you to have uh, a flat EEG despite the fact that the brain would then uh, return to normal function over uh, an extended period once that toxic metabolic issue is corrected, or hypothermia. So the patient must be uh, at an appropriate temperature. There are uh, false negative uh, unidentified signals that can be picked up on EEG that may say that the patient is uh, completely alive. However, the remainder of the brain death exam will, be, uh, will indicate that the patient is dead. And in that case, uh, they usually move on with a diagnosis of brain death. Evoked potentials are another realm of neurophysiology and are used to monitor the brain and neurologic tracts. A peripheral stimulus is applied and then we monitor the uh, sequential response that ends in the cortex. That is in SSEPs or somatosensory evoked responses. However, in motor evoked responses, we apply a transcranial stimulus and observe the, tr the peripheral response. So basically, we move right along the same pathway uh, that we, we, live, we move along the pathways in the same way that those nerves transmit responses in order to assess their function. One of our ways of uh, looking at evoked potentials is visual evoked potentials. This would be performed on surgeries around the eye and around the optic nerve when you're concerned about uh, causes of blindness. If you were to have a tumor next to the optic nerve, uh, the surgeon might be concerned about the degree of uh, distraction uh, and retraction that is placed on the optic nerve and be one wonder whether or not the optic nerve is being harmed. This is a relatively simple slide that shows incident light coming in from the left and going through uh, several layers of cells in order to hit rods and cones. Those rods and cones then produce electrical signals that are impacted back out and processed through these uh, four different types of cells that are, are evidenced in this diagram. Uh, as you can see, this is very complex and in reality it is very uh, very much sensitive to anesthetics. Uh, it's sensitive to everything from volatile anesthetics to propofol, uh, somewhat sensitive to benzodiazepines, etc. Uh, so these are very seldomly practiced in, uh, in, in seldomly used in clinical practice currently. There is a group in Japan that's claiming that they have found a way to make these better. Uh, however, their their light has not uh, uh, been shown through to clinical practice widely as of yet. Again. Uh, multiple intricate connections, highly sensitive to anesthetics, uh, reasonably compatible with benzodiazepines, and uh, rarely used. Looking at brainstem auditory evoked responses, or BAERs, uh, starting in the lower left here, we see uh, a foam insert into the ear canal and our bones of the ear canal and the eardrum uh, moving on to the cochlea that then supports a signal down the cochlear nerve to the multiple uh, nuclei in the pons. Those then project to both sides of the brain so that you can identify where a sound is coming from. And these, each relay produces its own wave. So we see waves one one being the cochlear nerve coming in, and then the uh, proximal nuclei, two and three, exhibit these waves, etc., moving on down the line to the seventh wave. These relays in these nuclei are extremely stable and extremely robust. This will tolerate 
a volatile anesthetic up to 1.5 to 2 mac uh, without changes in the brainstem audit auditory evoked responses. They're typically used whenever there is surgery being performed on the uh, facial nerve or uh, adjacent to the brainstem to make sure that whenever they're not pushing too hard on uh, the pons in order, and that would result in uh, changes in the auditory evoked responses. Again, multiple connections in the brainstem nuclei are highly robust tolerant of high max of volatile anesthetic and insensitive to propofol, largely for surgery around uh, nerve 8. Uh, nerve 8 lives in a uh, small cramped bony space and they worry about surgical retraction trying to uh, work in that small bony, bony space uh, harming the nerve. Electromyographic potentials are another form of monitoring that are important. We'll either do free run EMG, where you would monitor muscles for motor unit firing due to irritation of a motor nerve, or stimulated EMGs, where an electrical stimulus is applied to a bunch of tissue to determine if there is a motor nerve uh, inherent to that bunch of tissue before it is severed during a dissection. Uh, in the latter case, you're monitoring for muscle twitch, uh, starting with a low, low current and then increasing uh, stimulus to elicit a twitch or uh, to, to not elicit a twitch and be able to move on with, with a dissection. Stimulated EMGs are also used during spinal surgery uh, after instrumentation of the spinal column in order to make sure that there is an appropriate amount of bone present between the screws that are placed uh, in the vertebra and that there's enough bone between the, the vertebra and the actual column itself that the, the, the screw isn't impacting on a, uh, a portion of a nerve. EMGs are insensitive to anesthetic, fortunately. Uh, with regard to neuromuscular blockade, uh, there are reports that they will tolerate two twitches on train of four. Uh, surgeons at my institution are typically interested in bolusing uh, some non-depolarizing muscle relaxant at the beginning of the case and allowing it to wear off uh, whenever they actually test uh, their screws with a stimulated EMG near the end with the idea that that will facilitate surgical exposure uh, in the beginning and not alter the EMG at the end. Uh, with regard to the EMG, whenever they're, they're testing the EMGs toward the end of the case, it's rare that we would uh, need to actually reverse the, the muscle blockade as long as we had uh, three good twitches. One of the benefits of having the, some neuromuscular blockade is that it reduces background noise and it also keeps the patient from jumping off the table if they do happen to stimulate a uh, major uh, motor nerve during their EMG testing. SSEPs, probably the most common form of neurophysiology that we perform. Uh, an electrical stimulus is applied to activate low threshold myelinated peripheral nerves. It forms an action potential and an SSE signal, signal potential uh, is actually less than both brain and muscle potentials. So you actually have to tease out a very small signal from relatively larger brain and muscle potentials. Uh, those are two sor major sources of noise. The advantage that you have with the SSEP is that you know how often you're administering the signal. So by performing appropriate filtering and amplification of when you know your signal is going to hit, you can use averaging and you can actually look at how well that sensory pathway is functioning uh, during your anesthetic. You should realize that 
whenever you have uh, a, a lot of jumps going on in your arterial line, uh, this may be due to their SSEP stimulation. Uh, I had a case just today where it was also impacting the pulse ox tracing and we had to move the pulse ox tracing to the ear uh, in order to uh, get a p appropriate pulse ox reading uh, without the SSEP signal interfering. Here we have a diagram of what we're actually doing to, to look at SSCP stimulation. So the stimulation here is going on at the median nerve at the wrist. And the first set to, to look at is from the periphery to the brachial plexus. So they'll place a, a wire, also, a needle also over the brachial plexus, and that will tell you whether or not you have a peripheral positioning injury in this arm uh, with pinching of the brachial plexus either at the, the shoulder or the nerves at the elbow. Higher levels are also able to be monitored. You can look at the potential across the brachial plexus going to uh, a higher area in the brain, such as brain stem to cortex, and that will give you some uh, peripheral junctions within uh, uh, the midbrain processing for those areas, as well as uh, brain stem processing, I should say. Uh, and then get up to the actual cortex itself. Looking between two points on the cortex, uh, you can get what is called the N20 potential, which is uh, consistent with the, the area in the brain where you would be have represent feeling in the homunculus uh, regarding the area innervated by the median nerve. I point out the N20 because the N20 uh, potential is uh, considered predictive in patients after uh, cardiac arrest as to whether or not they will uh, regain appropriate cortical function. A significant change in SSEPs interoperatively would be a 50% decrease in amplitude uh, or a 10% prolongation in latency. Uh, you would start to see effects at about 0.5 mac of volatile agent. Uh, however, modern filters, processing, and uh, detection equipment typically tolerate uh, over 1 mac of volatile to 1.3 or even 1.5 mac of volatile agent uh, in a healthy patient. You may need to do troubleshooting in a patient that has somewhat of a peripheral neuropathy already uh, due to a neurologic disease or due to uh, neuropathy from neuronal degradation due to diabetes that would be longstanding. Uh, neurophysiology, your neurophysiologist would first increase the current uh, and then possibly alter the stimulus frequency in order to tease out their signal. You would want to be aware of patient issues such as uh, hypothermia. Things that you could do to improve SSEPs are to increase oxygen delivery to those nerves by increasing the mean arterial pressure or increasing the uh, hematocrit and the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. You might decrease the volatile agent or consider a total IV anesthetic in order to provide appropriate monitoring conditions for the SSEPs. It's possible to add an automidate infusion uh, or a ketamine bolus. These would typically be added whenever you're doing pre-position baselines or uh, getting baselines after positioning but before the surgeon would start. The important thing to realize here is that if the surgeon is doing something, uh, performing a distraction or, or retraction on a nerve to add an automidate infusion or a ketamine bolus to improve uh, a signal really is not appropriate. Uh, in those cases you would be masking some nerve damage that the, the surgeon would be causing and you're certainly not going to send the patient home with a uh, ketamine or automidate infusion in order to allow them to have feeling in their legs. So you wouldn't want to do that just to mask things in the OR. Transcranial motor evoked potentials. Uh, you're stimulating the skull uh, 
with a signal recording in the periphery. Uh, you could pr record at the muscle, that's known as CMAP. Uh, you can record a nerve or a neurogenic MEP or a, uh, over the spinal cord looking at a D wave. Uh, you're going to monitor or map a corticospinal or a corticobulbar tract. Most frequently, these are corticospinal tracts that are performed in uh, scoliosis surgery. In stimulation, with stimulation of the cortex, activation of the corticospinal tract uh, and EMG of a distal uh, nerve. Muscle relaxant cannot be used with transcranial MEP. This is a diagram of what this would look like. You would have transcranial stimulation uh, over the lower limb or a motor cortex and following down the corticospinal tract. Uh, if you would do a laminectomy, you could place an appropriate monitor in the epidural space that would produce that D wave and tell you uh, exactly what was happening there. Those can sometimes be used in spinal surgery but are very rarely used. Uh, you look at the H reflex, which is a uh, monitoring over the peripheral nerve prior to actually getting to the motor, uh, the, the muscle that it will elicit the motor response. Or you can look at the actual myogenic MEP over the anterior tibial muscle. Typically, that is what is done. They work all the way down to the uh, myogenic MEP. This is a chart that summarizes the an impact of anesthetics on neurophysiology. Uh, it's seen that volatile am anesthetics uh, dramatically alter the amplitude of MEP and are not, uh, not compatible with that mode of monitoring. Propofol is much better tolerated whenever you're doing motor evoked potentials. However, they can decrease amplitude in high doses. Moving on to our next subject in our outline, we have pain. And this is primarily pain from a uh, receptor standpoint and a drug standpoint rather than chronic pain syndromes uh, that will be covered elsewhere. Our first medication is our go-to of the opioids. All the opioids bind opiate receptors. Uh, they are G receptor coupled and result in hyperpolarization of sensory neurons. Uh, they act on opiate receptors uh, that are both pre- and post-synaptic. The opioids are good for treating both somatic and visceral pain, uh, not as much for neuropathic pain. In periods of acute inflammation, upregulations of mu receptors uh, make pain more difficult to treat and increase the requirements of opioids. In chronic infl inflammation, there is a down uh, regulation of mu receptors, meaning that with chronic inflammatory pain, that pain will be less responsive to opioids because there will be few, fewer mu receptors to treat in order to achieve the sensory neuron hyperpolarization uh, that is desired by dosing the opioids. Opioid action sites include the uh, dorsal root ganglion prior to entry to the spinal column, the substantia gelatinosa of the dorsal horn, the periaqueductal gray, also in the uh, spine. That is an area that modulates spinothalamic tract input, and that will be uh, highlighted in a moment, and also in the medulla, uh, the most proximal opioid action site where opioids result in sedation and respiratory depression. So the spinal thalamic tract input is, provides two things. There's a direct STT that, that provides a pain input to the higher centers and thalamus and an indirect STT that provides ascending arousal. This is why stimulating someone and causing them pain causes them to wake up. Also, if you're experiencing pain, then you will tolerate a higher dose of 
opiate prior to becoming sedated. This is the difference why if you give someone in uh, pre-op holding uh, 100 micrograms of fentanyl, they can be very sleepy. However, if you have someone that comes into uh, the pre-op area with a painful orthopedic uh, injury, then giving them 100 of, of fentanyl would have less impact on their uh, awareness or sedation level. Opioids have multiple receptor targets. There's the mu uh, receptor. Uh, mu receptors tend to decrease GI transit and result in the side effect of constipation. Mu-1 receptors have a low abuse potential, and Mu-2 receptors, however, have a high dependence and also provide a great deal of respiratory depression. There's been a significant amount of pharmacology work with drug companies trying to target uh, the Mu-2 receptor uh, in order to relieve the uh, dependence on opiates or the uh, respiratory depression that they cause. The delta receptor is also involved with dependence. The kappa receptor uh, stimulation there results in hallucination. Uh, there is a school of thought that it results in anti-shivering. However, there are other an animal models that uh, dispute that. So that is not a, a, a fact that I could see them testing uh, on the board examination. Again, opioid side effects stimulate each opioid is going to stimulate multiple receptor types, uh, leading hyperpolarization of neurons that emit, emit acetylcholine. Uh, that lack of acetylcholine in the gut will cause constipation. Uh, in the mouth, that will be an anti-sialagogue. That anti-sialagogue activity related to opiate use is why your patients that are on long-term opiates or abuse heroin uh, tend to lose their teeth. They lose their top teeth first because that is the non-dependent portion of the mouth where uh, there is less, uh, uh, less saliva is, is going to begin with. Uh, they'll also have sedation and urinary retention as well as meiosis, meiosis being a uh, small pupil. In the medullary respiratory centers, opioids will reduce CO2 responsiveness more so than oxygen responsiveness. This is uh, a, an important difference uh, that you're looking at CO2 responsiveness with the medullary uh, centers and, uh, and that opioids are going to reduce the CO2 responsiveness. Spinal injection of opiates without a local anesthetic can yield analgesia with minimal impact on sympathetic outflow, and this results in maintenance of systemic vascular resistance. On an oral board question, uh, you could be asked whether or not a patient with aortic stenosis who is having uh, some lower abdomen, pelvic, or lower extremity procedure uh, should be, would, would be eligible for a uh, spinal anesthetic. If you inject morphine there, uh, you will have, you can potentially increase, uh, induce adequate analgesia and anesthesia, uh, and that morphine will cause delayed respiratory depression. Uh, which should be a concern for you. That delayed depression is due to slow migration to the medullary res respiratory centers by the highly uh, uh, hydrophilic morphine. Now we'll talk about each individual opioid. opioid. Uh, morphine being the prototypical opioid and the original. Uh, it is hydrophilic. Uh, many others are lipophilic. Again, spinal injection causes a delayed respiratory depression. Histamine release is caused by morphine, and if you have a concurrent pheochromocytoma or carcinoid tumor, uh, injection of anything that results in histamine release 
can cause uh, an outflow of the, uh, the species that are produced by, uh, by those tumors. Morphine is metabolized in the liver to morphine 6 glucuronide. It is an active metabolite uh, that some consider to be as potent, if not more potent, than morphine itself. And morphine 6G is renally excreted and not dialyzable. The concern here is that if you put a patient on the floor uh, and give them a PCA uh, and that patient also has renal failure, the morphine 6G will accumulate and can result in significant respiratory depression and cardiorespiratory collapse. Again, because it is not dialyzable, you don't need to necessarily redose after a patient would get dialysis. Fentanyl, it's the prototypic lipophilic opioid. Uh, its lipophilicity makes it both, makes it very sh fast acting uh, and short acting because it is easily redistributed. It has 100 times the potency of morphine uh, because it is so able to cross the uh, cellular membranes due to its lipophilicity. Transdermal dosing of fentanyl uh, has some advantages. Uh, it reduces constipation and uh, also reduces somnolence. So the transdermal form of, of fentanyl is currently favored in chronic pain as opposed to uh, fentanyl uh, oral items such as uh, lollipops that were, or were formerly popular. Concerns about fentanyl is that it can be serotonergic and lead to chest wall rigidity. Uh, you might also be asked, uh, fentanyl is the most commonly abused drug by anesthesiologists. Methadone is the longest acting opiate, uh, good for maintenance of patients with a history of opioid or heroin abuse and withdrawals. Concerns with methadone are, include QT prolongation. Methadone is interestingly the only opioid with NMDA antagonism, making it a very uh, making it a step beyond morphine in terms of the uh, receptors that it hits and the therapy that it might provide. Methadone is dialyzable, uh, therefore dosing should be adjusted for uh, hemodialysis schedules. Meperidine is another opioid, that's, uh, opioid that has largely fallen out of favor uh, in terms of large volume use. Uh, it is metabolized to normoperidine. Normoperidine it requires renal clearance, and if normoperidine collects, it can lead to seizures in high, di in high doses. Meperidine also inhibits uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uptake and can lead to serotonin syndrome uh, if other serotonin modulating medications are being used by the patient, such as MAOIs, uh, TCAs, SNRIs, or even the new S, newer SSRIs. Loperidine in small doses, 12.5 milligrams, is considered to be the best for shivering. Uh, some propose that that is related to a kappa opioid uh, receptor mechanism, and that is largely disputed. Alpha-2 agonists are also good for pain and sedation. The ratio of alpha-1 to alpha-2 uh, determines their central uh, or sedative effect versus their peripheral slash hypotensive effect. So clonidine is typically seen as a medication for uh, blood pressure control, and its ratio of alpha-1 to alpha-2 is 1 to 200. Dexmedetomidine is more specific for the uh, for alpha-2 and thus gives more of a central sedation than does clonidine. 
dexmedetomidine has been approved for uh, sedation for awake fiber optic intubation, as well as intensive care sedation for up to 24 hours. Dexmedetomidine's loading dose is one mic microgram per kilogram of patient. It is associated with hypertension and bradycardia due to uh, stimulation of a subtype of peripheral alpha-2 receptor uh, that leads to some vasoconstriction. In order to avoid that, uh, dexmedetomidine loads are given over approximately 10 minutes. Long-term infusions of dexmedetomidine can lead to hypotension, uh, particularly in the elderly, and dexmedetomidine does provide some form of analgesia. An intensive care use for dexmedetomidine is that it can be used with benzodiazepines or phenobarbital uh, for alcohol withdrawals, which is are better uh, delineated in the section on intensive care. The mechanism of action of dexmedetomidine is something that's pretty wonderful. So we often look at dysfunctional sleep that is produced after uh, anesth anesthetics, and it is due to all of the ways that our anesthetics uh, alter CNS function. Dexmedetomidine is uh, very chic in that it goes in at, at the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus in the hypothalamus is the sleep switch. Uh, while awake, the locus ceruleus uh, turns the sleep switch off via norepinephrine-mediated inhibition. Dexmedetomidine blocking the locus ceruleus input causes the VLPO to be on and the patient to go into a natural state of sleep. The advantage of that natural state of sleep is that respiration is maintained. Thus, we use dexmedetomidine for uh, sedation uh, prior to awake fiber optic intubation because that will do, have the least respiratory depression and this is the mechanism and why that might show up on uh, anesthesia boards. Other neurologic drugs and their concerns in the perioperative period. Uh, serotonin modifiers, as we see this list, uh, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, and MAOIs all increase MAC slightly. Uh, the TCAs are known to be arrhythmogenic. SSRIs have the potential to inhibit platelets. MAOIs increase norepinephrine and epinephrine stores. This is particularly concerning because if ephedrine is dosed, that can result in a massive uh, release of, an, of the endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine stores uh, with concomitant hypertension that could uh, result in heart, in, in heart failure in the appropriate patient. Dextromethorphan or meperidine in the presence of an, presence of an MOI uh, can lead to serotonin syndrome and is a definite concern. Anticonvulsants. Uh, it's important to understand that the preoperative use of anticonvulsants does correlate with the risk of intraoperative awareness. Some of the anticonvulsants that you will typically see are carbamazepine, phenytoin, and barbiturates, and those three all induce P450 enzymes and then alter the metabolism of other drugs. One might say that they simply do not play well with others. If a patient in the ICU is started on phenytoin or barbiturates and is also on uh, Coumadin, then you would want to closely monitor their INR or uh, perhaps alter their dose uh, as the P450 system would, inhib would alter their Coumadin metabolism as well. Phenytoin is one of the most commonly used uh, anticonvulsants. Uh, 
Its mechanism of action is blockade of voltage-gated sodium channels that lead to myocardial depression. Uh, a fast administration can lead to dysrhythmia or complete heart block. Phenytoin is soluble at a pH of approximately 10. Classically, injecting phenytoin and uh, rocuronium or something else that's acidic in the same line at the same time uh, could result in precipitation of either of those entities uh, that could then block your peripheral IV from flowing. Again, phenytoin is contraindicated in heart block due to its uh, impact on uh, voltage-gated sodium ch channels. Long-term exposure to phenytoin results in decreased acetylcholine receptor response to endogenous acetylcholine there is a subsequent upregulation in acetylcholine receptors. What that means is that if you're going to achieve neuromuscular blockade and you want to use your rocuronium perhaps to block acetylcholine receptors, you're going to have many more acetylcholine receptors to block. And this will require more and more rocuronium in order to do so you're also going to increase P4, P450 enzymes in the liver such that uh, you will speed the degradation of your rocuronium and it will have a much shorter half-life. So you're going to dose higher, give higher doses of rocuronium uh, much more frequently in order to produce uh, the motor block that you desire. Anti-Parkinson's drugs are another topic on our outline. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is known for autonomic dysfunction. I wanted to say that first so that you would uh, not just jump into the rigidity and bradykinesia that is, that is typically noted with Parkinson's. Uh, you have difficulty with swallowing and you would have concerns about this patient uh, protecting their airway or not. You would also look at impact on PFTs and uh, whether or not this patient would have an increased risk of pneumonia due to uh, an inability to, to clear secretions or an inability to protect their airway uh, uh, more proximally. You would taper anti-Parkinson drugs only if necessary, uh, being aware of the potential for neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, septor, uh, secondary to abrupt withdrawal of those anti-Parkinson's drugs. Among the anti-Parkinson drugs that we are concerned about, selegiline is a common MAO-B inhibitor and would not be compatible with meperidine. Postoperatively, you would want to avoid anti-dopaminergic antiemetics in the presence of uh, a patient with Parkinson's as obviously blocking dopamine in a patient who has a disease based on a lack of dopamine uh, will cause them to have difficulty with uh, swallowing, protecting their airway, uh, etc., and can lead to worsening uh, autonomic dysfunction as well. Anti-Parkinson's can, there's also anti-Parkinson devices such as deep brain stimulators. Uh, that supply pulsations to the subthalamic nucleus uh, in order to neutralize the uh, lack of, inter of, of nerve mass in the substantia nigra. Most, if not all, of those deep brain stimulators are MRI compatible, uh, but typically you would turn off a DBS uh, if you're going to use electrocautery to avoid thermal injury to the brain and the potential for damage to that DBS. Uh, you would also want to reduce uh, diathermy output uh, in order to decrease the potential for harm. Along the theme of all these medications are long QT syndrome. Uh, so long QT syndrome can be produced by a number of perioperative medications including SSRIs, SNRIs, and TCAs. Uh, 
both the typical and atypical antipsychotics will result in long QT syndrome. Ondansetron and all of the 5-HT3 uh, inhibiting drugs will prolong the QT interval. Methadone, uh, meperidine, uh, droperidol, uh, the fluoroquinolones, as well as diphenhydramine uh, result in a long QT syndrome. Uh, now, our next point on the outline is anesthesia reversal agents. Physostigmine. Uh, this is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor uh, with the potential to reverse anesthesia, uh, either volatile anesthetic or propofol, uh, via potentially potentiating uh, acetylcholine levels. It will cross the blood brain barrier, uh, making it much making it effective, whereas neostigmine would not cross the blood-brain barrier and would not be able to increase anesthesia, uh, co coexistent with neostigmine's reversal of peripheral neuromuscular blockade. Physostigmine is dosed at 1 to 1.5 milligrams uh, over uh, a minute or two. Uh, you would be concerned about diag about uh, injecting it faster than that because it has the potential for serious side effects, including slowing of the AVN or SA nodes, uh, leading to uh, the possibility of central seizures, uh, increased salivation, or increased pulmonary secretions. Flumazenil is a medication that is used to reverse uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, however, although propofol works on a uh, GABA pathway, it will not reverse propofol. You should use caution whenever uh, dosing flumazenil as it may present seizures in patients with a history of seizure disorders uh, or patients that are chronically treated with high doses of benzodiazepines. Yeah, it's recommended that you titrate flumazenil uh, 0 0.2 milligrams every minute up to 1 milligram. Uh, of course, you might dose, start with a higher dose of flumazenil if the patient is in extremis. Uh, and you need to remember that the half-life of flumazenil is only approximately an hour, so you may need to repeat it uh, about every hour or two. Emesis is the next point on our topic outline and is primarily noted regarding the chemoreceptor trigger zone, or the CTZ. Its location is in the medulla uh, adjacent to the fourth ventricle. Here we see a number of inputs to the medullary vomiting center the medullary vomiting center being here in red and with its stimulation resulting in emesis. Potential inputs include uh, cerebral stimulation, either smells or uh, emotional states can lead to stimulation of the vomiting center and vomiting. Uh, the chemoreceptor trigger zone is something that we worry about the most in anesthesia and is thought to be why volatile anesthetics in particular uh, impact and, and increase uh, patient postoperative nausea and vomiting. Other, another input would be the stomach, uh, either direct stimulation of the stomach or uh, blood in the stomach, residual after surgery. And vestibular inputs as well can uh, go to the medullary vomiting center and cause uh, vomiting. Our different targets and therapies. Uh, steroids are one uh, anti-emetic. Uh, their uh, mechanism of action is unknown. Uh, there are some studies in certain populations that show patients having more nausea and vomiting uh, after being dosed steroids. The chemotactic uh, zone, uh, chemoreceptor trigger zone receptors that can be targeted including include DOPA2, uh, antagonism of there, reducing output 
and from the CTZ and reducing vomiting. Alpha-2 receptors have some uh, anti-nausea uh, components, as do mu opioid receptors. Uh, basically, all of the opioids that stimulate the mu opioids, the, the mu opioid receptors, uh, result in increase in nausea and vomiting. And, of course, serotonin uh, antagonists, such as Zofran uh, or Ondansetron, will decrease output to the medullary vomiting center. Interestingly, in the stomach, you have some serotonin receptors. You also have some responsiveness to metoclopramide. And the vestibular centers are sensitive to uh, muscarinic alterations, such as those from uh, scopolamine uh, that act to reduce postoperative nausea and vomiting, or histamine, particularly the H1 receptor, uh, that can be a result that the stimulation of that area will uh, result in vomiting. Speaking of histamine receptors, uh, we have the H1 receptor, uh, known for its anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, Anti-H1 uh, receptors across the blood-brain barrier will have anticholinergic effects. Those include diphenhydramine or hydroxyzine, and that is where they get their uh, anti-emetic effects. Uh, H2 blockers uh, will result in decreased acid production. Uh, Anti-H2 uh, drugs will block parietal cell acid secretion. Uh, onset is approximately an hour, and they last approximately 12 hours uh, with the idea of decreased acid in the stomach, uh, decreasing uh, the urge for uh, emesis. Uh, there is some debate over whether to use H2 uh, blockers versus a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, the protein pump inhibitor will have a delayed onset uh, something like four to six hours, uh, but lasts for approximately 24 hours instead of the uh, twice daily dosing of an H2 blocker. Uh, diphenhydramine and hydroxyzine, again, being antipyritic, uh, they block allergic reactions. Uh, these can include uh, medication reactions that would re release histamine. Uh, they do cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, leading to their sedative effects as well as anti-emetic effects. Diphenhydramine in sp specifically can resolve uh, dystonic reactions uh, related to other medications and can be prophylaxis for patients that, re that generate Redman syndrome uh, in response to too fast a dose of uh, vancomycin. Serotonin uh, 5-HT3 antagonists uh, inhibit responses from the chemoreceptor tri trigger zone. Uh, side effects include possible uh, elong uh, elongation of the uh, QT interval and the potential for uh, triggering of migraine headaches. So yeah, young women are prone to migraines and also prone to uh, 5-HT3 inhibitors uh, causing those migraines uh, after their surgery. Uh, and that may uh, lead someone to maybe use less of the 5-HT3 antagonist or to switch to another mode or just use a TIVA altogether uh, to reduce the postoperative nausea and vomiting that would be induced by the volatile anesthetic. Droperidol. Uh, this is a dopamine antagonist and antipsychotic. Uh, again, it works in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Uh, there is an FDA warning uh, about QT prolongation and fatal arrhythmias, and that has led droperidol to largely fall out of favor in treatment of, of postoperative nausea and vomiting. Metoclopramide is a drug that works via multiple mechanisms. Its primary anti-emetic effect is anti-dopaminergic, uh, acting centrally in the CTZ. It does 
somewhat increased GI transit. Uh, you would not want to use metoclopramide in someone with a bowel obstruction, uh, as that could worsen the situation. You would be aware of extra pyramidal, extra pyramidal symptoms uh, after dosing metoclopramide, including uh, tardive dyskinesia, uh, the potential for neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and metoclopramide can trigger a release of uh, metanephrines from a pheochromocytoma. Again, moving through our uh, outline includes uh, talk on the autonomic nervous system. Uh, here we have uh, a variety of targets and comparison of their sympathetic uh, versus parasympathetic uh, effects. So when I think of sympathetic effects, I think about fleeing the tiger and in terms of the, and the fight or flight effect. Uh, with the pupil, uh, that's going to cause madriasis. That pupil needs to be dilated. I need to get as much light in as possible so that I can see the tiger that's chasing me. I need to run away, so I need to get oxygen to uh, my working muscles and my bronchioles will dilate. That's a beta-2 response. In the heart, uh, you will have increased uh, chronotropy, that's rate, inotropy, that's squeeze, leucinotropy, which is uh, the rate of relaxation, and those are all via beta-1 so that I can increase my cardiac output and uh, have enough uh, oxygen delivery to my legs in order to run away from the tiger. You will have mild reductions in secretions and uh, Alpha-1 sympathetic output causing vasoconstriction to uh, raise blood pressure, somewhat balanced by vasodilation via uh, beta-2 uh, vasodilation. These are countered by the parasympathetic nervous system and the effects of increased acetylcholine. Uh, in the pupil, this will cause constriction or meiosis. Similarly, the bronchioles constrict, and this will be a negative chronotrope in the heart. Uh, also, dramatically increase uh, oral and pulmonary secretions. Often, my residents, I ask uh, about what will happen if you would give a, a regular resident just uh, a large dose of neostigmine through an IV when they weren't looking. And the answer is that they would go into bronchoconstriction and basically have an asthma attack. They would become extremely bradycardic and they would have a number of secretions that would further decrease our ability to ventilate that person. And left off of this slide is you have, you have the potential for uh, actually causing muscle weakness due to an excess of acetylcholine so that the patient would uh, fall down at the same time. The board examiners seem to be interested in uh, the role of peripheral efferent nerves uh, here we show one of this is just of the somatic nervous system and a motor fiber and acetylcholine uh, innervating a skeletal muscle. Looking at the autonomic nervous system, things become much more uh, specific. Here we have uh, initially the uh, sympathetic outflow going to a uh, ganglion. Uh, preganglionic fibers emitting acetylcholine, uh, that being the uh, transmitter of choice in the ganglion itself. And when you get to the target organ, if that is smooth muscle, heart muscle, or glands, then norepinephrine is going to uh, be performing uh, a fair amount of the, the, the transmission there. If you're going to a sweat gland, then you're going to use acetylcholine in the preganglionic fibers again, uh, and then acetylcholine at the sweat glands as well. At the adrenal medulla, the 
postganglionic fiber is the adrenal medulla itself and will be secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, as a response to uh, acetylcholine signaling from uh, the appropriate nerve. The parasympathetic uh, system is unique in that they not only do the preganglionic fibers uh, use acetylcholine for neurotransmission, uh, as does the peripheral, uh, as, as does the postganglionic fiber use acetylcholine to communicate with the heart muscle and uh, glands. So in communication, communication with the heart, uh, it is the abundance of acetylcholine after uh, neostigmine administration that would lead to uh, a decreased heart rate, uh, profound parasympathetic tone, and the potential for heart block. Uh, since the parasympathetics are most often turning off uh, mechanisms of, of hemostasis, then you must put the ganglions much closer to the actual uh, innervated organs so that the target that is being turned off is not too many targets that are turned off as that may lead to failure of uh, homeostasis for the organism. So in the parasympathetics you have much longer preganglionic fibers and relatively shorter postganglionic fibers. Whereas in the sympathetic system all of your ganglions are going to be relatively close to your uh, central uh, nervous system. More interestingly now, our, our next topic in the outline is special challenges in neurosurgery. An initial uh, challenge is positioning, uh, particularly the prone position. It's important to in realize that if you lie flat prone on a flat table, you will have an increase in your intradominal pr pressure that will shift the abdominal contents uh, caudad, uh, or cranially, sorry, and uh, result in an increase in intrathoracic pressure. Uh, they will also uh, constrict the IVC, resulting in decreased preload with venous pooling uh, in the periphery and the potential for bleeding uh, below those areas. Uh, that can be reduced with frames, which we'll talk about in a moment. The main issue with prone positioning is postoperative visual loss. There are a number of different etiologies for postoperative visual loss and we're going to walk through them and learn them via this chart. The first is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. On examination, looking at the optic disc, you'll see retinal hemorrhages. Those hemorrhages are due to emboli, most often occurring during cardiac surgery, but we're covering it here because it's a neurological complication of cardiac surgery. The pathology is uh, many strokes in the posterior ciliary arteries, but because of the location of these hemorrhages uh, in the anterior portion of the, the optic nerve and around the retina, uh, you will have a normal MRI to go with anterior uh, ischemia. Posterior ION will result in a normal optic disc because the pathology is much posterior and distal to the optic disc. Predisposing factors would include uh, prone spine surgery and radical neck dissections. The pathology in this case is hypoperfusion uh, due to a lack of flow in the peel arteries. On MRI, you would show infarct because this is a significant portion of the, uh, of the optic nerve that is being uh, infarcted uh, with PION. The last form of vision loss uh, perioperatively that is common is, uh, uh, is uh, central retinal artery occlusion on op 
on the optic disc examination, you'll see a cherry red spot. This is typically related to increased ocular pressure. Uh, this can happen in any case where someone would end up leaning on the eye. It is very possible in a prone spine uh, that if the appropriate head positioner is not used or if there's something else providing pressure on the eye, this would then decrease perfusion pressure to the retina itself, uh, resulting, in, uh, uh, resulting in that cherry red spot. Uh, another form of pathology uh, could be an embolism to that area. Prone positioning uh, leading to post-operative visual loss. Uh, this is from the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Risk factors for post-operative visual loss include uh, obese males, uh, cases with blood loss of greater than one liter, uh, surgical duration greater than six hours. So if they're there for a long time, uh, that can increase the uh, risk of post-operative visual loss. Uh, also, the use of a Wilson frame uh, can result, can increase the risk of post-operative visual loss, whereas other frames uh, seem to be better. Uh, you would want to avoid uh, controlled hypotension that's not an established risk factor, but it's a recommendation from the Patient Safety Foundation that you avoid uh, controlled hypotension as that may uh, result in decreased perfusion uh, to the retina and into the optic nerve. High doses of crystalloid uh, are also recommended to be avoided, uh, instead using colloid as appropriately for uh, perfusion. Uh, the idea here is that with high doses of uh, crystalloid, uh, you have more potential to form edema, uh, with the edema adding to the risk of, uh, of nerve injury. Another challenge in uh, neurosurgery is sitting in neuroanesthesia is a sitting craniotomy. Uh, here, typically, they're going into the infratentorial uh, space. Uh, the posterior fossa is a small space with limited, limited elastance. It's important to realize that edema or hemorrhage in this area can quickly lead to brainstem pressure uh, with cranial nerve dysfunction or hemodynamic collapse. Sitting craniotomy uh, places the patient at risk of venous air embolism. Uh, the requirements for venous air embolism include having an open vein. Uh, in this case, the dural venous sinus is tented open automatically by its attachment to the falcs uh, and the dura. Uh, it's an open vein above the level of the heart. And those are your requirements. Procedures for a venous air embolism intraoperatively uh, well, these are the procedures that are associated with venous or embolism. You have a sitting craniotomy, as we discussed, uh, central venous catheter discontinuation. Uh, if you pull from the uh, internal jugular with the patient that is sitting, you could leave an opening uh, that would allow air to uh, be sucked down into the IJ and end up in the heart. Uh, during C-section with uterine eversion, the uterus is above the level of the heart and the uterine sinusoids are prone to allow venous air embolism. Uh, during a liver resection, the hepatic sinusoids uh, are also open and can lead to air in, uh, intrusion into the central circulation. Uh, particularly during liver resection, uh, the surgeon often wants to reduce liver congestion, to reduce bleeding, and that can lead to a hypovolemic state with uh, the possibility of air entrainment. Uh, during a complex spine fusion, there's a lot of bone decortication uh, and veins that are open then in those bones and on flips of pine, they can lead to uh, venous air embolisms. It has been, there have been case reports of venous air embolism on application of head pins uh, that those could get into uh, appropriate veins and lead to embolism. Venous air embolism monitors, you'll simply need to memorize these. Uh, 
Uh, the most specific of, of the most sensitive of monitors are uh, are the is the TEE. Of course, if you're in a sitting cranny, it's going to be uh, difficult to place a TEE and use that to monitor for your air embolism. Uh, precordial Doppler is pretty specific. It is uh, pretty sensitive. It is more sensitive than a PA catheter or end tidal CO2 uh, detection of change. So basically, the idea is that you want to find your air embolism with a TEE or a precordial Doppler before you have a change in cardiac output, which will be evidenced by the PA catheter or by a change in end tidal CO2. Of course, the uh, severity of venous air embolism is proportional to uh, the number of cc's per kilo that are entrained. Uh, with a volume of less than 0.5 cc's per kilo, uh, symptoms would be decreased end tidal CO2 as well as the potential for hypotension. Uh, at 0.5 to 2, you're going to get right heart strain and significant hypotension. Depending on the patient, this will be tolerated. With a volume of greater than 2 cc's per kilo, you are likely to suffer from RV failure and hemodynamic collapse. The responses are to tell the surgeon to flood the field uh, and to place bone wax in any open bone to reduce uh, further air entry. Uh, a valsalva maneuver uh, or compression of the, uh, the vein leading that, that's allowing the inflow of air uh, will reduce venous flow or air entrapment. Uh, you can also drop the head. Uh, this will result in uh, blood running back out of the open vein, and you may need to uh, drop the head to perform compressions at this point anyhow. Nitrous oxide will fill air emboli and make them larger uh, very quickly, so you'd want to stop any nitrous that's being used for the case and probably switch to an FiO2 of 1.0 in order to maximally... Uh, uh, provide uh, oxygen oxygenation to the patient. During a sitting cranny, uh, TED hose can be used to decrease venous pooling in the lower extremities. A pre-op echocardiogram uh, can be useful to rule out uh, an, an atrial septal defect. Uh, primarily, you'd be worried, most commonly, you're worried about a PFO causing a right, a, the potential for a right to left shunt so that a small uh, air embolism could make its way into the uh, arterial circulation and produce a stroke by entering the, the, the carotids. You would want to measure your blood pressure with an arterial line transducer at the skull base and uh, consider a CBC for resuscitation, although a long arm multi-orifice catheter is the more proven uh, catheter for therapy in order to pull out any air uh, that would embolize into the heart. If you're using a precordial Doppler, you're going to listen for the characteristic mill wheel murmur and use that to inform the surgeon uh, that of the potential for air embolism so that you can stop the air embolism while it's small before it becomes too large. Next item on the outline is cerebral protection. Uh, looking at randomized control trials that are important in anesthesia, we start with the GALA trial. This is general anesthetic versus local anesthetic. Uh, randomized 3,500 patients for carotid endarterectomy to get either general or local anesthetic. And it's important to realize that they showed no difference in stroke or survival at 30 days postoperatively. The other large cerebral protection trial was the IHAS trial, or International Hypothermia for Aneurysm Surgery trial. Uh, 1,001 patients for elective cerebral aneurysm clipping were uh, randomized to either a temperature of 33 degrees or 36.5 degrees with the idea that mild hypothermia might decrease cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen and that that metabolic rate for oxygen uh, decrease could be cerebral protective and reduce the postoperative stroke. Uh, in summary, there was no difference in NIH stroke scale or functional status for patients at 24 hours or at 90 days postoperatively. That is why we largely don't do, use hypothermia uh, for aneurysms. Post-arrest hypothermia uh, was rather in vogue until this study came out in 2013. Uh, and 
you can see that they found that hypothermia at a targeted temperature of 33 degrees uh, did not confer a benefit as compared with a targeted temperature of 36 degrees. Um, it is likely that the uh, ACLS guidelines with regards to recommendation for cooling are going to change when they are republished uh, in, on October 15th of 2015. There was recent association by a publication by Mashour and colleagues, that's M-A-S-H-O-U-R, of uh, perioperative stroke in patients with a hemoglobin of less than 9 uh, grams per deciliter. A, another study regarding perioperative stroke uh, showed that uh, general anesthetic increased the odds ratio for stroke. These were patients having uh, TKAs and THAs. Uh, we can see here that there is a very high odds ratio for stroke in general versus patients receiving only neuraxial anesthetic for their uh, joint replacement. Now we talk about head bleeds. Uh, ruptured aneurysms result in subarachnoid blood. We're all very familiar with those. Another etiology is an intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, uncontrolled hypertension can result in hemorrhage into the basal ganglia. That is the most common form of intracerebral hemorrhage. It's also possible to have amyloid disease resulting in a, a cortical bleed in the periphery. A arteriovenous uh, malformation or AVM can rupture resulting in either intracerebral or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Beginning with aneurysms, uh, we look, classify those as either intact or ruptured. It's important to realize that only ruptured, in a ruptured vein, only clot is preventing re-rupture. The treatment for those is open clipping versus endovascular coiling. Securing the aneurysm via open craniotomy, uh, the craniotomy itself is associated with uh, significant morbidity. Uh, during clipping, a temporary parental artery clip is placed. Uh, at that point, the uh, neurosurgeon is likely to request you to drive perfusion uh, via collaterals via the circle of Willis and watch uh, the EEG and or SSEP in order to see that there is appropriate uh, perfusion and, and neuronal functioning. Uh, it is important to realize that only approximately uh, 40 to 50 percent of people have a fully intact and functional circle of Willis. Hypothermia, as mentioned, has no benefit via the IHAS trial, and this was uh, also uh, supported with a Cochrane review uh, in 2015. Uh, the IHAS trial data was not meant to look at this, but a post hoc analysis uh, showed no benefit to propofol uh, slash thiopental bolusing for burst suppression uh, during temporary artery, uh, temporary clip placement. Uh, with coiling the aneurysm, uh, endovascular coiling uh, has improved odd ratios of being alive and independent. However, you also, because of the lack of uh, morbidity associated with the craniotomy, however, the aneurysm uh, may also be, uh, uh, may also recannulate requiring retreatment. Uh, ruptured aneurysms uh, that have already led to subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, it's important to realize that 30% of patients with one aneurysm will have another aneurysm. Uh, a history of subarachnoid hemorrhage is predictive of uh, future aneurysm rupture. Re-rupture of an existing aneurysm portends a very bad prognosis. And it is the transmural pressure on the wall of that aneurysm, that being the mean arterial pressure on the interior of the aneurysm versus the intracranial pressure outside of the aneurysm that determines whether or not uh, that clot remains stable and whether or not that uh, is, is all going, that clot is going to shift off and allow the, the aneurysm to re-bleed. 
So you'd want to avoid draining large volumes of CSF that would decrease uh, the intracranial pressure. You would want to reduce, uh, avoid uh, rapid hyperventilation in such a patient. And you would, of course, want to reduce uh, large increases in mean arterial pressure. Uh, that isn't actually written as a bullet point on the slide. Hunt Hess score uh, is, uh, correlates with level of consciousness and the neurologic exam. Uh, decreased levels of consciousness and worse, worsening deficits uh, correlate with an increase in mortality. Uh, the Fisher score uh, looks at the amount of blood in the head on the CT, and more blood in more places correlates with an increased risk of vasospasm. Vasospasm is of concern in the uh, post-subarachnoid window, regardless of the means uh, used to secure the aneurysm. Post-bleed is most frequent, but uh, vasospasm is most frequent in post-bleed days 3 through 12. Uh, it can be uh, monitored via transcranial Doppler or more invasively uh, by CT angiography or by uh, direct cerebral uh, angiography. Uh, there is the potential for vasospasm actually leading to stroke. Uh, to, to reduce that stroke, you might need to induce hypertension to drive perfusion into the areas of vasospasm. Or uh, they could go in in the interventional radiology suite with intra-arterial verapamil or uh, balloon dilation. If they're using uh, intra-arterial verapamil, you should be prepared for uh, significant uh, hypotension and myocardial depression with that. There's no good data to support uh, Triple H therapy. That used to be hypertension, hypervolemia, and hemodilution. Uh, it is more focused now on Hypertension, uh, hypervolemia is not necessarily appropriate. That leads to a lot of uh, cases of pulmonary edema. Uh, hemodilution uh, also was thought to uh, improve viscosity. Uh, now it's considered that the uh, appropriate vis uh, viscosity uh, balance versus oxygen delivery balance related to anemia is uh, around a hematocrit of 30. So at 30, you have uh, relatively non-viscous blood with good oxygen carrying capacity, and that's uh, the target that's typically used. Magnesium uh, was thought to reduce vasospasm, and that's uh, largely out. Uh, oral nemotipine uh, can sometimes be used because these patients need to have uh, uh, some blood pressure control uh, in the early period. Uh, there was one study that showed uh, nemotipine as being, uh, as presenting, preventing vasospasm and actually improving uh, long-term outcome. Uh, no one has really been able to uh, consistently show that, uh, so nemotipine is, is largely out as a treatment for vasospasm. Endovascular coiling, uh, intraoperative uh, re-rupture is uh, always a potential, and uh, blood pressure is typically capped at 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, heparin is used for uh, the introduction of the coil introductor sh introducer sheath into usually the femoral artery, and protamine uh, may be required if the aneurysm ruptures again while they're trying to coil it. So basically, they need to wire into the aneurysm. If that wire disrupts the aneurysm and causes it to rupture, uh, you will then have heparinized blood uh, streaming into the brain, and uh, protamine should be on hand. Uh, if the patient has contrast dye, there's a potential for an allergic reaction, as a lot of dye is used uh, in this procedure. Postoperatively, you want to keep the legs straight, uh, have a normal systolic blood pressure, and watch for the potential for embolic stroke. AB, an AVM is treated somewhat differently. Uh, approximately 10 to 20 percent of patients with an AVM also have an aneurysm. Uh, what they're going to do here is introduce a catheter next to the AVM to isolate it and then shoot uh, 
glue or other embolic material into that area. Uh, they may request a de reduced cardiac output so that the glue doesn't embolize all the way through the M AVM into the circulation that has time to set up within the circulation. Uh, uh, typically, there is no change in systemic vascular resistance during the embolization, uh, unlike uh, bone cement in, in THA. After uh, obliteration, uh, you have the potential for vasoplegic vessels. Uh, basically, due to the, low f the high flow conduit that is the AVM, the areas around it may be uh, vasoplegic and uh, from longstanding dilation. Uh, you will need to control the blood pressure in order to minimize hyperperfusion-induced cerebral edema. So basically, a patient being that's hypertensive after their AVM has the potential to develop edema and go into seizure due to uh, the edema adjacent to that area. Pituitary adenomas, classically, these present with uh, bitemporal visual defects. Key here is to maintain perfusion pressure of the optic nerve uh, in order to reduce any potential for blindness. A preoperative endocrine panel is necessary. You'll look at ACTH secretion and cortisol levels as well as growth hormone levels. Uh, ACTH, of course, leading to Cushing syndrome, uh, hypokalemia, hypertension with possible LVH, uh, as well as obstructive sleep apnea. And increased growth, growth hormone leading to cardiomyopathy uh, with the potential for conduction defects, high blood pressure, uh, obstructive sleep apnea related to macroglossia and subglot subglottic stenosis, as well as type 2 diabetes. Electrolyte disturbances is another item on the outline. Here I've highlighted uh, that Whenever you're looking at the different electrolyte disturbances, you have diabetes insipidus that is uh, evidenced by a high plasma sodium. Uh, that sets it apart from the other two. The real key here and the potential uh, dilemma is to confuse SIDH with cerebral salt wasting because they both have low plasma sodium. However, one has a high volume status with the SIADH and is treated with free water restriction and demeclocycline. If you treat, if you mistake cerebral salt wasting for SIADH and you continue with this low sodium and you have a low volume status and you provide that patient free water restriction, you're going to have a significant problem with uh, renal failure and the potential for stroke. So that patient with cerebral salt wasting is going to get iso or hypertonic fluid and fludrocortisone in order to uh, retain uh, their salt and stop their cerebral salt wasting. More challenges. <clears throat> fluid. Uh, hyperosmolar therapy is often requested and it's important to understand how that functions. Uh, you're going to draw interstitial fluid, like whenever we talked about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine slide uh, with the pie, di the pie chart. Uh, draws interstitial fluid across the intact blood-brain barrier and into the plasma, uh, reducing volume in that area. Uh, mannitol will be associated with diuresis as an alternative to mannitol. You can use hypertonic saline uh, with 3 to 23 percent sodium, uh, which is caustic and needs to be dosed by a central venous catheter. Mannitol has the difficulty of diuresis. It also, uh, in large boluses, can actually cause cerebral uh, dilation and a transient uh, and small increase in intracranial pressure. Isoosmolar fluids are normally appropriate to be used throughout the case. You would want to avoid hypotonic fluid because uh, that would drive free water into the interstitial space and cause more edema. CSF drainage, uh, you, would be wanted, you would want to concern yourself with the use of a CSF drain as overdrainage uh, can result in acquired uh, Chiari 1 malformation, uh, leading to a headache or hearing deficit, uh, cerebellar dysfunction, and if extreme, uh, can result in herniation with brainstem dysfunction. <clears throat> 
the subdural, the cerebral shift can result in subdural hematoma due to tearing of bridging veins. And with a dural opening, uh, you can lead to pneumocephalus uh, and risk for seizure. Cerebral blood flow. Uh, this is a function of CO2 autoregulation and flow metabolism coupling. Here we see uh, the typical uh, person like you and I who is uh, at rest with appropriate autoregulation with over a pressure uh, that should be a uh, cerebral perfusion pressure on the x-axis uh, between uh, 50 and 150, there is autoregulation that keeps blood flow constant. So with small changes in, well, moderate changes in pressure, you will have the same blood flow to your brain. At high pressures, you will have a, uh, you will overcome the autoregulation and result in hyperemia. Uh, and that is to be avoided, as should be avoided, uh, low levels of cerebral perfusion pressure resulting in brain ischemia. PaO2, uh, it's not responsive until you get to a PaO2 somewhere less than 60, and then you have a cerebral blood flow that increases exponentially uh, beyond that. This is just trying to get enough oxygen to that brain. We talked about the high cerebral uh, oxygen extraction ratio uh, earlier, and that is when that is uh, uh, tr evident at the low values of PaO2 uh, in increased cerebral blood flow. PaCO2 is, of course, what we often use in order to manipulate cerebral blood flow. Uh, we can see a fairly steep curve with PaCO2, and uh, the resultant change in cerebral blood flow uh, that occurs when CO2 pressure uh, changes. Typically, uh, you'll want to use hypocapnic vasoconstriction uh, to reduce POCO2 and uh, vasoconstrict and reduce brain volume. Uh, that should be more reduced uh, arterial blood volume uh, to the brain. Uh, as a downside, this will reduce oxygen and hemoglobin dissociation. Uh, so in extreme cases, uh, with a very low PaCO2 uh, below uh, the high 20s, uh, this could lead to a stroke. Again, PaO2 less than 60 results in strong vasodilation, and you would never want to uh, get to that level either. Uh, another impact on cerebral blood flow is the vol is level of volatile anesthetic, and this works as a function of concentration of volatile. Initially, you will have a reduction in cerebral metabolic rate with corresponding decrease in cerebral blood flow. Uh, and a decrease in brain volume. So this is autoregulation in proportion to uh, the actual cerebral metabolic rate. Beyond a volatile concentration of 0.6 mac, you will lose autoregulation and result in inherent vasodilation, cerebral vasodilation by the volatile anesthetic to increase cerebral blood flow and increase uh, brain volume. Uh, an awake craniotomy is another ch challenge in neuroanesthesia. Uh, in this case, you'd be worried about pain. Uh, initially, the scalp, the cranial periosteum, and the dura are sensate. The brain itself are insensate. So you can use uh, moderate to high levels of anesthetic in order to get through the scalp, uh, periosteum, and dura. And whenever the uh, surgeon is actually touching the brain, and doing a resection interoperatively, the patient is uh, completely uh, without sensation of that area. Uh, complications to avoid, uh, placing the head in pins, you'll want to avoid a, a chin to chest uh, positioning with airway obstruction from the beginning. Uh, beware that frames can be used in awake craniotomies to help guide the resection and limit airway access. And during uh, an awake uh, brain manipulation seizure is possible, the typical means to treat that seizure is via cold saline on the brain to quench the seizure, and uh, additional benzodiazepines or propofol may be used uh, intravenously uh, with concern for the airway and blood pressure.
placement of a deep brain stimulator. These are becoming more and more popular now uh, as a management for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and these are placed under an awake craniotomy. If a patient is on park, has Parkinson's disease presenting off of medications, you'd be worried about dementia, uh, dysphagia with an inability to pr uh, protect their airway, and the potential for very labile blood pressure uh, when all of those dopamine agonists uh, go away. Patients preventing for ventriculostomy or ventriculoperitoneal shunt, uh, the indication is hydrocephalus with increased intracranial pressure, uh, typically a non-communicating hydrocephalus. Uh, you would like to introduce with an increased uh, elevated head of bed, elevated at 30 degrees, to reduce intracranial pressure. Uh, mild hypocapnia is appropriate for intubation to uh, reduce intracranial pressure, and you're likely to not use hyperosmolar therapy as uh, it's not essential to uh, dry out the brain. Patients with spinal cord damage, uh, you're going to lose uh, functional residual capacity secondary to uh, accessory muscle denervation. Uh, it's important to realize that the denervated muscle uh, at 48 hours uh, you present with excess immature acetylcholine receptors. Adding, uh, stimulating them with succinylcholine will cause an excessive muscle depolarization with potassium release with a potential for hyperkalemic arrest. Remember that it's high doses of potassium that are used to stop the heart uh, during open heart surgery. Another concern after spinal cord damage is autonomic hyperreflexia. This can occur in a patient with cord injury at or above the level of T6. Uh, stimulus below the lesion uh, is not met by descending mod modulation of descending pain inhibitory pathways. Uh, it results in vasoconstriction and a bolus of fluid to the heart, uh, as well as uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Classic stimuli are surgery below that level uh, a full bladder or bladder, bladder catheterization itself. Uh, the consequences, patients can become very sick from this. Uh, there's potential for cardiomyopathy, uh, all of the sequelae of, of high blood pressure, and these can be seen in relatively young patients uh, after their cord injuries. Uh, also the potential, of course, for aneurysm rupture. Can't miss that since we're talking about neuro anyhow. Uh, you could consider a spinal anesthetic uh, in order to block that innervation going, that the stimulation going up to T6 and, uh, and block the autonomic hyperreflexia uh, afferent pathway. Another item on our, our list was to define uh, consciousness. Uh, if you're asleep or under sedation, you are arousable. Uh, if you're in a coma, you may be minimally responsive, and if you, are, you have brain death, you are have a, representing a loss of critical functions. So for sleep, we already talked about the VLPO and the hypothalamus inducing and maintaining sleep. Uh, Dexmedetomidine, of course, blocks norepinephrine, allowing the VLPO to induce sleep. Coma, this is a vegetative state with uh, possible wakefulness uh, without awareness or consciousness. Uh, this is the controversial points around uh, the Terry Schiavo case that uh, might lead it to be present on, uh, on the boards. It's possible to occur due to trauma. Uh, there could be an infectious insult, toxic metabolic, or cerebrovascular accident uh, resulting. Uh, in that coma. Glasgow Coma Score, you should know to intubate at 8 and always recall whenever calculating a GCS on an exam that a corpse has a GCS of 3. Not opening their eyes, no verbal response, and no motor response. Why they made it 3 to 15 instead of 0 to 12, the world may never know. Traumatic brain injury, uh, it's important to resuscitate these patients to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure. 
when they looked at whether or not uh, uh, hypotension or uh, hypoxemia with a pulse ox less than nine, value less than 90 was more critical. Uh, patients with, uh, were more likely to tolerate the low pulse ox value than they were to tolerate the low perfusion pressure. Uh, you would not want to give somebody with a TBI hypothermia. Uh, corticosteroids are also out. There is no proven uh, neuroprotectant in traumatic brain injury, and chronic hyperventilation is never a good idea. Prophylactic hyperventilation is also a bad idea. If you think the patient's ICP is going to go up after their TBI, uh, you need to wait and then treat it appropriately. Again, you're going to intubate for a GCS less than or equal to 8, uh, manage intracranial pressure with a target less than 20. Uh, you're going to use hyperosmolar therapy, uh, euthermia, and uh, likely an EVD because this is going to be a non-commutative uh, hydrocephalus, so you'll get a normal pressure on an LP but a high pressure on an EVD. It's important to uh, monitor glucose and control it tightly as when the brain that is injured sees high levels of glucose, it turns, tends to burn through it, uh, resulting in high levels of lactate and worsening of brain damage. Again, beware of neurogenic shock if you have a C-spine injury. Uh, using therapeutic coma, this was uh, brain death. Uh, brain death was on the outline again. Uh, you want to diagnose brain death in an adult with an etiology. You would rule out intoxication, residual drugs, or sedation and look for homeostasis in terms of glucose, sodium, uh, et cetera. You'd want that patient to be normothermic uh, with a normal blood pressure. You cannot uh, consider someone with a systolic blood pressure less than 100 and not responsive to be brain dead. Uh, they could just be inhibited due to their hypotension. Uh, pupils are typically fixed in midline. You're going to look for absent protective reflexes such as gag, cough, and corneal. And uh, the definition of the apnea test is written out here. Uh, basically, you'll pre-oxygenate, uh, then turn off ventilatory support, and look for a PaCO2 greater than 60 and an arterial pH less than 7.28 uh, without the patient triggering uh, breathing on their own, and that will establish uh, a dysfunctional brainstem. Ancillary tests are more fancy but can be used. Uh, to look the blood, at blood flow to the cerebral cortex, uh, as well as the EEG and the N20 response on SSCP, as was described previously.